Hi, this is Don Forsyth. We are talking about group structure today. One of the most important aspects of a group is you need to understand one thing about a group to, to be able to predict the group's behavior and the responses of people within that group. Know about its group structure. We've already talked in earlier presentations about norms that structure people's behavior, roles, how once people step into a role it determines how they'll act in current situations and future situations, but now it's time to turn to the final aspect of group structure, perhaps the most essential one, which is the relations among group members. Uh, we will talk about such things as social network analysis, network dynamics, and sim log. The basic aspect of social network analysis is trying to map out the structure of a group, so it, it is best to think of it as a mapping-like process. Um, where are people located, in, in a sense, in interpersonal space? in relationship to other people within the group. Uh, this work goes back to Jacob Marino's early work on sociometry, where a sociogram, for example, would, would describe the connections among group members. Uh, social network analysis has become a bit more sophisticated, but it still starts with this question of who is connected to whom. So here we have an example of a group where people are interconnected, as we can see, but it's a relatively flat group. And we can also get an idea of what would happen if just two links were removed within this group. Well, then we would find that, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's two clicks, subgroups within the overall group, linked, in this case, by this, this one relationship. So in this case, we, before we removed the links, we had three links tying the group together nicely. It looks like one happy group. But if we were to lose these two links, if this person was not connected to this person, this person not connected to this person, then it would be almost a schismatic group, ready to break up into two groups, as it turns out. And uh, that's just one example of how important it is to understand your, your social network. Groups take all different sorts of shapes, but typically, for example, you might want to distinguish between a, a centralized group and a decentralized group, which all makes sense. Um, in this case, linked by that one single individual. But this person, too, has ties to many people. These people are all linked one to another. And we might see ties across this space as well, which would, of course, be more likely. Our example uh, group for this particular chapter were the Andes survivors. And they're all charted here. This is an example. No one actually took social network uh, recordings for this particular group, but after reading the book Alive by Jean-Pierre Pauls, uh, we can sort of make an estimate about what the group probably looked like. And in terms of social network analysis, if you look at the number of individuals, our n is 13, how many, how many ties would we need to tie everybody to everyone else within that group? And that number is given by this formula. 156. So that's how many times would be needed to link everybody to everybody else. So Magnino is not linked to Fernandez, and Sentez is not linked to Serbino, but it's possible that they could be in the long run if there were 156 ties there. So what's in terms of the density is probably maybe the very first thing we need to know about a group. The density talks about well, how many of the potential ties are actually there. So it's the degree of connectedness of the group's members as indexed by the number of actual ties linking members divided by the number of possibilities. And in our case, in this particular case of the Andy survivors, it's uh, 0.19. Although we think of this as a, a very cohesive group, really only 20% of the ties are in place, although this is hypothetical as well. Um, other kinds of questions we might ask about are the centrality of the group between this closeness and the possibilities that there are holes as well. Um, out degree or the number of ties initiated by an individual in a directed network. So how many ties, for example, does Vincentes send out to others? Mengino send out to others? Um, just two uh, for those individuals. Whereas others, such as Fido Strouch, he sent out far more ties to other people. So th that's the out degree number. In degree is how many are received by others. And again, Vito Strouch has a pretty high number of in degree relationships. Many people are linking him, whereas Mangino only has two. 
Uh, between us is the degree to which a group member's position in a network is located along a path between other pairs of individuals in the network. Are they between other people? Uh, this is a pretty important uh, position within the group that that individual is removed from the group. It means that a, a hole could be created within the group. So that would be a gap in its structure, possibly creating a weakness within the group. Closeness is the inverse of distance, of course. It just means how how close one member is to another. So the Strouches, for example, are quite close together. They're not distant whatsoever, whereas Fernandez is quite distant from Mangino. To, for Fernandez to reach Mangino, it must move through Fido Strouch. Well, let's move through East Strouch to Al Gorda. It's difficult, in fact. So back to Epps. We'll go from Fernandez to Fido Strouch to Ducati to Canessa to Mangino. So you see there's a number of steps taken. And when they talk about degrees of separation, um, that's that concept. It's the degree of closeness represented by the group. Applications have been many for social network analysis um, with, the, with the growing popularity of social networks. Um, Facebook, for example, um, people have been able to apply social network analysis to extremely large networks, not just groups, but networks. Uh, this is an image of a very large network studied by Christi Christakis um, and Fowler trying to identify um, changes in weight that occurred in a group of individuals in a medical study over a long period of time. And what their findings suggest, and not not that those findings have not been challenged by researchers, is that uh, friends who uh, gain weight, uh, their friends also tend to gain weight. So if you are not separate, if you're separated by only one step from another person who begins to gain weight, you're more likely to gain weight. You know, if your distance is three between you and that other person, you'll be less likely to gain weight. What are these social networks based on? Well, it, it might vary, as already mentioned. It could be based on status. It could be based on attraction. This is a hypothetical example of a more hierarchical status network. And it is true that relationships based on status do tend to be hierarchical. It means that individuals at the bottom have less ties in terms of influence. Individuals at the top have more ties in terms of influence. So they take on that pyramid-like shape over time. Researchers um, have found that in many cases the formal status structure of a group does not match its informal structure. So studies, for example, have looked at the organizational structure mandated on the org chart by, uh, by a group. Uh, an organizational unit might suggest Michael is the leader. He has three direct reports, Brandon, Ryan, and Jessica. Jessica has two reports. Ryan has three reports. Brandon has three reports. But if you actually look at its informal structure, it doesn't look anything like its formal structure. That in fact, Jessica is the individual who is most influential in the group. And Michael and Jessica correspond with each other, but actually Michael influences Jessica more than, well, he turns to Jessica for, for influence. Although Jessica doesn't influence him back, but um, she has clearly at the center of the communication network. Uh, these links might be based on interpersonal attraction rather than status. So here we have an example of a status hierarchy here. It looks hierarchical, but attraction networks tend to be more reciprocal. So if person one likes person three, it is more likely that three likes person one. This reciprocity is explained by Heider's balance theory, uh, which has the basic fundamental assumption that reciprocal relations are balanced relationships that if we are in a social network where there's um, uh, an odd number of negative relationships, that group will be imbalanced and the group members will strive to correct that imbalance. And that basic hypothesis has been supported empirically quite frequently. Attraction, status uh, are two forms of relationships, but communication is also very important. It's who speaks to whom most frequently. And again, these sorts of networks can be centralized or they can be decentralized. Um, a classic publication by Marv Shaw, who I studied my group dynamics with uh, at the University of Florida, um, made a strong distinction between these forms of centralized networks and, and decentralized or non-centralized networks. 
and gave them such interesting names as Wheel, ComCon, and Pinwheel, uh, Wheel, Kite, Circle, ComCon. ComCon, in all cases, means that everybody can talk to everyone else. The Wheel forms are usually centralized network where there's a central position that has the most communication. Uh, what Shaw found in his research and analysis of the impact of different communication structures on performance was that centralized networks tend to be most efficient until you get to the point where too much information is being shunted through that central individual and then the network becomes saturated and becomes dysfunctional and that individual is overwhelmed by the flow of information. It is the case that members who occupy more central positions within uh, a centralized networks are happier. Uh, more satisfied. So a as a result, what you do find is that individuals in decentralized networks, you know, since most people are decentralized, are equally happy. Um, and only a few people would be, be more happy. So to, to make that clear, in a centralized network, there's one or two very happy people uh, because they are in the central position. But in decentralized people, there's more happy people because no one's left out of the centralized position. There is the general tendency that in hierarchical networks, information flows differently up and down. Particularly negative information tends to flow down rather than up over time. Uh, the final topic we should discuss uh, very briefly is Robert Bales' systematic multiple level observation of groups theory. After many years of studying groups and examining groups, he his theory is based on the idea there's three pivotal dimensions that you can use to identify the roles within the group and the structure of the group, and those dimensions are dominance, submissiveness, friendliness, unfriendliness, and acceptance or non-acceptance of task-oriented authority. Um, he has developed a measure uh, that you can take to identify where a person stands along these three dimensions, and it can generate an, a graph in which the dominant submission is represented by the size of the circle representing an individual. Accepting of task-oriented is a forward action. Opposing task-oriented task -oriented authority is backwards. And friendly is positive or negative. And for example, here's a chart of our Andes survivors, which locates them again. This is, of course, hypothetical since Simlog measures were not actually taken from this group. It identifies where all the groups might exist. Um, so we have individuals who are dominant, not so dominant, friendly individuals, a large cluster of friendly individuals who are also accepting of authority. And you have a smaller number of people who are unfriendly and less responsive to the group's authority. This is Don Forsythe, speaking of groups. Thank you, as always, for joining me.